Hello everyone, it's Philip James coming to you from Wuxi. Why Wuxi? Because in 1930, this was the location of an uprising against the Japanese led by this gentleman off my right shoulder to your left, Mona Rudo. So why were the Japanese in Taiwan to begin with? Because in 1895, Taiwan was ceded to Japan. So they in turn send their military to Taiwan. They take over the country. It wasn't the first time that Japan sent their military to Taiwan. The first time they attacked Taiwan was in 1874. So uh, in order to know more about that story, we must head south. And it's really an unfortunate incident that began in 1871 when a boat of Japanese people ran ashore in southern Taiwan. So for that story, let's head south. So in 1871, 66 Japanese people get stranded here at this bay in Taiwan. And what happens next affects some history and it's relevant to the Japanese influence in Taiwan. So here we are, 1871, 66 people stranded. They start walking into the mountains and a couple of locals say, stop, you really don't want to go in the mountains. This could be quite dangerous. Uh, some of the natives are not that friendly and the Japanese ignore them, they keep on walking. But something happens where the locals attack the Japanese, so they kill them. Here I am in the village of Tongpu, and that behind me is a memorial. It's a burial for, for 54 Japanese people. In 1871, their ship is stranded, and they wander up into the mountains, and they're massacred. And later on, three years later, 1874, it's just the excuse Japan needs to attack Taiwan. So let's continue this story by going up into the mountains to Mudan. This monument marks the battlefield where the Japanese returned in 1874 and attacked the Aboriginal people. Their excuse for doing so uh, is retribution for the 54 Japanese people that were massacred. I'm walking right where the battlefield was in 1874. It's quite peaceful now, mostly rice paddies. It's beautiful. Uh, you would never know that this was a site of a lot of blood and gore and violence, but this happened in 1874. It was the first time Japan attacked uh, Taiwan. And it's really important to note this uh, because it kind of puts things in perspective for what happened later. So let's go back to Wuxi. Yeah, so it's truly, it's an unfortunate incident. The Japanese run ashore, they end up getting beheaded. Uh, the Mudan tribe keeps their skulls. So the Japanese return in 1874 for the Mudan incident, they collect uh, the remains of the Japanese people and then they bury them at the site that we visit. Before we get into the details about the Wuxi incident, we must also talk about the Tapani incident which occurred in 1915. So for that, let's go down to Tapani Memorial Park and hear a little bit more about that incident. So the year is 1915, and there's a big uprising with many local villages uh, that consist of native Taiwanese and some Chinese. So they've had enough, right? Uh, Japan's been here a while, uh, taking their resources, their minerals, uh, forced labor. So they had enough, so thousands of people get together, and they're led by these two guys. And they say we've had enough. So why is this uh, memorial even located right here. Let's uh, explore that further. This is the site of the Tapani Memorial, but Jingya yeah. says, in fact, if the memorial was to be relocated, maybe the better place would be the mountain. Yeah. Which mountain? Uh, 
So let's go to the mountain. And there's a memorial, kind of, a marker, a landmark, uh, a symbol, a statue. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Really, that's where really the center of this kind of tragic uh, battle uh, took place. So we're going to go up there and take a look. The year is 1915, the largest uprising against the Japanese. So this monument behind me marks the incident. So should the memorial be relocated here? Maybe, and maybe in the future it will be. It will, this overlooks the battlefield, so maybe it'd be most appropriate. Uh, but for now, let's head back to Wushu. So note, the Tapani incident is in 1915, but what it shows is resentment is building and it's bursting against the Japanese by the native Taiwanese. So the aboriginals are really fed up. So the native Taiwanese are fed up. What are they fed up about? Well, if you look at this part of the country and also see how it's rich in resources and the Japanese loved it for agriculture, for their farming, for the minerals, for the hinoki wood, for the for the rock that they would uh, pull out of here, but all that industry required labor. So, who did they have doing the labor? The native tribes people, and it's reported that the labor was forced, so uh, it was not being compensated. And meanwhile, there were acts of aggression that are reported against the native tribes people, against the women against families so if families were not cooperating the japanese it's reported would kill them and burn their houses down so this kind of marinades over decades and the men feel like their dignity has been stripped and they have nothing to lose so what do they do they organize the attack the unfortunate attack on the school grounds killing women children 130 Japanese or so, and over 200 were injured. Uh, but let's talk about the Wuxia incident for a moment. It happened at a schoolyard, just a couple minute walk from here. Um, let's take a walk over there really quick, take a look at the site, and then we'll come back here. This is the site. Uh, this is the site of the old school where Mona Ruda he comes and he they attack they attack here yes uh, many Japanese many yes here's Kenny here's Peter yes uh, both engineers they work for Thai Power so we are on the site of the old school the old Japanese school where Mona Ruda comes down with his uh, fellow tribesmen and he attacks right but there's nothing there's no there's no school here anymore the school was removed now Thai power has their office here both Kenny and Peter work at the office yes. but if you come to Wuxia and you're looking for the school where the Wuxia incident occurred uh, it is now Thai power uh, it's the office for uh, Kenny and Peter, and uh, so they work on the site. Is it kind of weird working on the site? A lot of misery happens here. Is there any ghosts? Some, some men, so will say they will hear the, uh, hear the some sound in the night, but not uh, every people hear that sound. So some people say they hear some sounds. Yes. Maybe suffering, and crying. No, they, they, like a uh, and, and move, and desk will be moved. Or like a and, desk is moved. Or a chair or a desk, and, but uh, and then there's a few few net will say net, but I don't hear anything about here. Mm. 
I would say standing here, the site itself is quite beautiful and peaceful when there aren't cars in the Bible. It's just a peaceful, beautiful, uh, peaceful, beautiful location, yeah, this site. Um, but wow, a lot of suffering occurs right here uh, on this location. And, uh, and like Kenny says, sometimes it goes to the past. People report hearing movements at night. Thanks. See you later, Kenny. So 130 people died there, including women and children. It was pretty gruesome uh, beheadings. But also, what is unfortunate is the ripple effect that happened afterwards. So, uh, those involved in the attack scattered to the woods. And the battle between them and the Japanese was ongoing for weeks. And one of the unfortunate things is the Japanese then collaborated with some of the other local tribes to fight against those who they deemed responsible for the attack at the schoolyard. So it pitted tribe against tribe. Next up, which is really unfortunate, the Japanese violated international war treaties and it's reported that they used nerve gas. So as depicted in the movie Warriors of the Rainbow, you'll see the Japanese warplanes dropping nerve gas um, on the native tribes people who were hiding in the woods. It's reported that there were over 500 deaths that resulted in retaliation after the schoolyard incident of the natives, including women and children, some uh, by suicide to uh, protect their honor. Another unfortunate ripple effect is anyone that the Japanese felt were associated to the people who were involved in the attack on the schoolyard, they put them on what they call the resettlement program. So for the rest of this video, we're going to go to the resettlement camp and see uh, where uh, anyone associated to this incident uh, by bloodline or anyone that the Japanese thought was associated and they removed them from their land and set them over the mountain there. So let's go over the mountain for the rest of this video. At a school. Wushu school. Why are we here? Why? Because after the uprising with Mona Rudo, they resettled anyone related to him and his tribe here. In this location, uh, I don't think we can call it a resettlement or relocation. It was more like imprisonment. Because if you look at the photos from that time, um, I mean, they built a wall around it and you couldn't leave. So anyone affiliated with uh, the tribe, Monobrudo, or the uprising, they were, I guess, I'm going to say imprisoned here, even though they call it resettlement or relocated. Um, but you can look at this area. It's now a school. And uh, just had a nice chat with some of the students from the school. And if we go over to the village here, Monobrudo's, like, uh, descendants, uh, live over here we're going to take a stop but you can see this area is absolutely beautiful uh they're right in the process now of uh growing rice and there's a lot of um, farming uh it's just a beautiful area but i think when you come through here if you have an eye for the history you will see so many relics and remnants of the japanese history and the aboriginal history in this part of taiwan let's head to the village looking for the resettlement camp and grandmother lived in the resettlement camp yes wow <laughs> and resettlement camp was here was right here here grandmother grandmother lived oh before 
Wow. We're discussing the exact location of the resettlement camp, and it's the elementary school. The school. Yes. yes. See you later. Bye-bye. With that, everyone, we will see you for part two of this video series. I'm Philip James. Um, hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, if you did, be sure to. If you did, I look forward to bringing you uh, part two of this video series. Until next time. Bye-bye. 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 Real quick, since this video is about Taiwan history, I know that some of what I say will be slightly inaccurate. I'm doing this with the best information I have available when doing research. So please comment below. Let's keep it a positive uh, conversation and share information. This is video number one in a two-part series. Part two is about Taiwan and the history during the Japanese era, told through landmarks, architecture, and culture.